every breath something you've given I receive I receive everything you have for me Lord I receive I receive everything you have for me Lord I receive I receive To learn to hold what I've been given Oh, I receive, I receive Everything you have for me I receive, I receive Well, good morning. See y'all this morning. Would y'all stand with us? And um, we're going to sing together. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. The death tried to keep you inside of the grave the enemy fought you he tried but he lost you cannot be stopped when we cried for freedom you tore down the wall The weight of our burdens, you carried it all. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. But you cannot be stopped. A mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus is triumph over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. We stand on your victory and shout out your praise. You're mighty to save Awesome in power Relentless in love You cannot be stopped Mover of mountains Breaker of chains Jesus is triumph Over the grave The battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. And there is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing There is nothing that can stop our God There is nothing that can stop our God There is nothing that can stop our God There 
aloud of your steadfast love in the morning for you have moved been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress O my strength i will sing praises to you for you O god are my fortress the god who shows me steadfast love O lord my god when i in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made i see the stars i hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art and when i think that god is son not sparing sent him to die i scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. With shouts of acclamation And take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And then proclaim My God how great Thou art Then sing my soul My Savior God to My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art.
we come to you this morning um, asking for vision, asking for sight to see you more clearly. Um, God, just take the, take the blinders off of our hearts this morning and let us see you more clearly through your word. Um, and we're, we're just asking you to, asking for your, your help with that this morning. Um, and we just pray this in Jesus' name. Children ages 5, 6, and 7 are dismissed for Children's Church. I'm going to give a missions update on two of our missionaries. Um, first one is the... Um, the brains, Calvin and Shelley, and uh, they are missionaries that serve with SIM USA. Uh, they, we've been uh, supporting them since 1993, and they currently live in Charlotte, North Carolina, but they're responsible for a project involving uh, 1,400 pastors in Namibia in nine different cities. They also work with the publication of books in the Lucchese language that's used in northern Namibia and southern Angola. And I received an email from Shelley yesterday, and um, she's got some concerns, and, and I asked her to uh, let us know how we could pray for them. And so here are some things that they are concerned about right now. Uh, ministry has taken a few interesting twists since the pandemic, but we are trying to pull things together for a trip to Namibia to push the third phase of the pastor's book set along in January. By God's grace, we have crossed over the six-figure mark in terms of financial resources for the purchase and shipment of books for this third phase. It has been faith-building to watch ongoing giving towards this immense need for resources for Namibian pastors. Uh, in the first two phases, we are privileged to supply 38 books for 1,400 pastors in 10 different cities. However, we are planning to increase the third phase number to 1,600 sets as the demand has increased, and we hope to meet the needs of youth workers and children's workers in this next phase. So we can pray for the book sets that uh, he's trying to get to these pastors so that they can use them in their ministries. Uh, they're also exploring with Oasis the possibility of helping with the management of translating the notes for the African Study Bible from English to Portuguese. It would be a four to six year endeavor. And the reason for this is there is a growing interest by Africans in all things African. And so a study Bible by Africans for Africa uh, seems a great way to move forward. So as we pray for the uh, brains, we can pray for those uh, specific needs. Also, um, we have a report from Jeff and Donna Crane, and they are with International Faith Initiatives. Uh, we've been supporting them since 2006, and as many of you know, they're uh, Donna's the daughter of Don and Lucy Barber, and um, they are working in the, uh, the nation of Ukraine. Uh, Jeff uh, is medical director of International Faith Initiatives and advisor to Universum Clinic in Kiev. Uh, Donna coordinates the orphan ministry and the refugee ministry, and you know there's been much fighting between Russia and uh, the Ukrainians on the Eastern Front as Russia is trying to take over there. So uh, I got a uh, email from Jeff, and here's what he has to say. The 2020 Ukrainian local elections will take place on Sunday, the 25th of October. In the election, deputies of district councils and rural uh, townships will be elected and elections for city mayors will be held. Reports of corruption are concerning. And we, if you're watching the news, you know all about Ukraine and the corruption that's there. So he says, please pray for God to put people in office who know him and who will work for the best of this country. Uh, he talks about uh, every Sunday and Thursday evening, uh, Jeff hosts medical English classes online for students and young Ukrainian medical professionals. 
These regularly involve young medical leaders across Ukraine and beyond, and he asked us to pray for that ministry. And during COVID-19 quarantine uh, months, uh, we have delivered and shipped many boxes of clothing, bedding, et cetera, to orphans, disabled children and their families, and to church plants near the East Ukrainian war zone. Uh, we need to continue to pray for that. They have not been able to get into the, uh, the orphanages for the younger children, but they have been able to minister to those. So these are two updates for our missionaries. And if you'll join me, let's pray for these right now. Father, we do thank you for your, uh, your blessings upon these ministries. Uh, we thank you for the brains and their continued uh, supplying of, of uh, books for our pastors uh, that are needed in these countries. We just pray your blessings upon them and, and, the and the, that you will supply the funds that they need to continue these ministries. We also pray for Jeff and Donna as they uh, work there in Ukraine and uh, the blessing that they have of working with these medical students and also with the orphanages. We commit them to you and we pray that your will will be accomplished in and through them as they uh, continue to serve you. Thank you so much for what you're doing for them. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Thanks, John. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It is uh, it's always a privilege to be able to gather um, on a Sunday morning like we do and um, to do what we're doing, to be with God's people in God's church in freedom like we have. Um, that is not something that we take for granted, and so uh, it's a joy to gather with you this morning. I want to extend a special welcome to anybody that might be uh, new here, whether you're tuning in online or you're here uh, physically present. We, uh, we love to see new faces, and uh, we appreciate you being with us this morning. Um, if you got a bulletin on your way in this morning, go ahead and grab one of these little connection cards and, and just fill that out. We just love to know that you are with us and to, to know your name. And uh, we mention this every Sunday, but if there's anything that we can be praying for you about, uh, you can jot that down too, and uh, we promise to pray along with you. On your way out, you can drop it at the welcome table in the lobby, and uh, they would be happy to give you a, a little gift on our behalf. Um, we're going to turn our attention to God's Word here. In just a second, we're going to be in First Thessalonians chapter 5, so if you've got a Bible or an iPad or a phone and you want to make your way there, First Thessalonians 5 is where we'll be, and while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. The question is this. Do you have any phobias? I mean, like, real, legitimate phobias. I was watching a video the other day of people that were spelunking. You know what that is? Uh, cave exploring. And, uh, man, these people were on their stomachs, and they were uh, crawling through, belly crawling through the, the tiniest, smallest little area in this underground cave, and I, I felt my heart start to beat a little faster, and I had this like panic and this dread come over me, and uh, it got so bad I had to I had to turn the channel, and um, that video uh, proved what I already knew that I actually have a little case of claustrophobia. I do not do well with confined spaces. I don't like watching people in small spaces. And uh, people have real legitimate phobias like this. If you are deathly afraid of spiders, you have what? Arachnophobia. If you are afraid of heights, you have acrophobia. Well, how about this one? How about apocalyptic phobia? This is a real thing. This is a fear and a terror and a dread that's brought on by the thought that the world is going to end. And uh, we have been talking about these issues for the past couple of months now in a series called In the Meantime, Hopeful Expectation for Jesus' Return. We've been studying through, uh, verse by verse, the letter of First Thessalonians. And there were a lot of people in this church, in this city of Thessalonica, that had a, a bad case of apocalyptic phobia. And so this is a letter that, that the Apostle Paul wrote to this church to talk to them about the end of the world specifically about the return of Jesus Christ. And the reason that, that Paul wrote them was to instruct them and encourage them and uh, clear up some misinformation that they had about the end of all things. So I did a little research this past week, and I found a real legitimate study about the, the, the top five apocalyptic fears that people have. Okay, Top five things that people are afraid of when they think about the end of the world. Number five is nuclear war. 
probably a, a real thing to, to kind of cross your mind, right? There are a lot of people that are afraid that a couple of nations are going to get into a little skirmish and they're going to bring out the big guns and the rest of us are going to kind of get caught in the middle somewhere. Number four, you ready for this? Robots. Robots. And lest you roll your eyes at this, check out this picture. This is from uh, Japan. This is a 60-foot robot uh, that the Japanese have made. You can watch the video of this thing. Uh, this thing moves, it, it bends over, it does all kinds of crazy things. If that thing ever becomes self-aware, we are all in trouble. And if you're rolling your eyes at that, have you ever seen those creepy robot Zambonis at Walmart that just kind of wander the aisles? And That's not weird or creepy at all, is it? People are afraid of robots, apparently. Number three is the sun. Some people are afraid the sun's going to move a little closer or it's going to explode and we're going to be toast. Right along with that, number two, super volcanoes. There are people that are afraid that that, uh, that big volcano in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is going to one day explode and, and uh, we're going to be in trouble. And then the number one top apocalyptic fear that people have, my Walking Dead fans know this one, zombies. Yes, zombies. What do you think of when you hear people talk about the end of the world? Remember the, the REM song from the 90s, right? It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Is, is this something that you feel okay about? Is this something that, that, that brings you hope? Or is it something that produces a bunch of uh, nervousness and, and dread in you? Well, Paul is talking to these Christians here in this city of Thessalonica as a way to remind them of the hope and the confidence that can be found in the truth that Jesus Christ will return. And as he starts this section of the letter here in chapter 5, he talks to these people about what's going to happen. And and what's going to happen is what he calls the day of the Lord. We see that right there in verse 2. He says, For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come. Now that specific phrase, day of the Lord, is only used five times in the New Testament. But there are similar phrases used in, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So sometimes it's called the day of Christ. Other times it's called that day or just simply the day. In our culture, weddings are such a big deal that if you went up to a woman that you knew was getting married and you said, hey, when's the big day? She would know exactly what you're asking about, right? She would know that you're asking about her wedding day and not her dentist appointment the following Tuesday. Well, what happens on the day of the Lord is so big, so monumental, so huge, that it can just rightfully be called the day. It's going to be the biggest day ever. So what is it? Well, the day of the Lord is the final judgment of God on a wicked world. It's the final judgment of God on a wicked world. You know, Jesus Christ came the first time in humility. He came in poverty. He came to seek and to save sinners like us. That's not how he's going to come the second time. He's going to come in power and majesty. He's going to come as a king, and he's going to come bringing judgment on a wicked world. And for thousands of years, mankind has been thumbing their nose in the face of God, and God has been so patient and so kind to give us chance and opportunity after opportunity to to repent, to turn from that, to turn to Him. But one day, those chances are going to run out. Now, if you are a Christian this morning, that is, if, if you've turned from your sin and you've trusted in Jesus, this is not a day that you have to fear. We're going to talk more about that here in a minute. But what Paul does is he tells these Thessalonians that this day, it's, it's certain. It's a done deal. He says again in, in verse 2, For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come. It's, it's going to happen. It's certain. He also says that the return of Jesus is going to be sudden. Verse 3 says, When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. A little phrase, peace and and security, was was sort of the slogan and the mantra of the Roman Empire at at this time. Rome had made these false promises to their subjects that they could have peace and security, and yet Paul says here, just when you think everything is going well, destruction is going to come suddenly. And then he tells them that it's going to be a surprise. How is the day of the Lord going to come? Verse 4 says, like a thief in the night. A thief breaks into your car or your home. He doesn't give you advance warning. And it's the same with God. Nobody knows the the day or the hour of Jesus' return. 
Check this out. Not even Jesus himself knows the day or the hour. This is something that only God the Father knows. Now, the timing of this uh, event was the big question that the Thessalonians had. When's this going to happen, Paul? Be, be specific here. Give us, a, give us a time. Give us a date. We got our, our, our phones out. We got our, our calendar app open. Give us something to jot down here. And notice what Paul says to them in verse 1. He says, about the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. So for Paul, the emphasis was not on the timing of this event, but rather how these Thessalonians were to to be prepared for this event. So maybe you could say it this way. When it came to the day of the Lord, the Thessalonians wanted to know when. Paul answered them with a what, who, how, and why. And friends, this is what we need to get today as well. When this is going to happen, it's not even worth thinking about. But how we are to live in light of this coming judgment, how we are to prepare ourselves for it, that is the most important thing. So I want to spend our time this morning talking about those four words, who, what, how, and why. And I think that'll give us some insight about what we need to know. Okay. So first of all, the who. Who are, who are we? Who, are, who, who is Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking to, to Christians like us. We're talking here about our identity in Jesus. He goes on in verse 4 and he says, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or darkness. Paul is talking to these Thessalonians and us here about our identity in Christ. And he says, you're not children of the darkness. You're children of the light. And that kind of language is used all throughout the Bible. The the Bible always compares and contrasts the people of God with those who don't know God in terms of darkness and light. And so when you become a, a Christian, when you fully surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you are awakened spiritually. You come out of the darkness. It's like the light has been turned on for you spiritually. I have this bad habit sometime of when I'm out and about, um, I'm wearing my sunglasses, it's bright out, and I'll go into a store, grocery store or something, and I'll forget to take off my sunglasses, and so I'm that guy that's wearing his sunglasses indoors. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, we were at, at Disney World, and we were going through all the rides, and I remember we went into to Space Mountain, and it's kind of dark in there, and I'm walking in, and it's, it's like pitch dark. And I'm like, this is dangerous. You can't see anything in here. They need, to, they need to turn the lights on in here. And then it dawned on me about two minutes later, I got my sunglasses on. Take them off, and I can, I can see. That's a good illustration of what it means to become a Christian. God brings you out of darkness. And what does he do? He gives you a new identity. You're now a child of the light. And so as you wait for the day of the Lord, as you wait for this final judgment of God, you wait with the Spirit of God in you. In other words, you you don't have to live in darkness. You don't have to get caught up in all the moral depravity that exists in our world. That's, That's the who. It's who we are in Jesus. And so since we're children of light, we have some responsibilities. And that's where the what comes in. The what is our responsibility in Jesus. He goes on in verse 6. He says, so then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Since we have been given this new identity, since we're now children of the light, Paul says our responsibility is to be awake and to be sober. He's talking here about avoiding a kind of spiritual dullness or or sluggishness. In other words, there should be a sobriety in our lives in light of the day. Because what happens when you're asleep? You're not aware of your surroundings, right? If you're sleeping, you're inactive, and you're vulnerable to attacks. Now, I uh, do not enjoy being pranked at all, but I love watching other people be pranked. And uh, so sometimes I'll just go on YouTube and watch prank videos. And, and without a doubt, my favorite uh, genre of prank videos are people that are in a car, usually on a road trip, and everybody uh, is awake except the person in the passenger seat, the front passenger seat. They're sound asleep. And you've probably seen these videos. They'll, they'll get up. The driver will find a big truck that's hauling another truck. 
and they're hauling the truck backwards. So you got this big, gigantic semi truck that's being hauled, and the driver will get right up behind the truck. And on three, everybody in the car will scream. And, of course, the, the person sleeping, the person in the passenger seat, wakes up and they see, see this giant truck facing them and they scream. And it's hilarious. It's funny. I would never want that to happen to me. Paul says, don't fall asleep like that spiritually. You need to be awake. You need to be sober. You need to be self-controlled as you wait for the day of the Lord. So think about your lives and think about when you are tempted to sleep spiritually. When does that happen for you? I know for me, uh, personally, I'm tempted to slack off spiritually. I'm tempted to fall asleep spiritually when there are extremes in my life, when things are going really, really well or things are going really, really poorly. Things are going really well in my life. Sometimes I have the the tendency to become very self-sufficient and forget God. Why, Why do I need the Lord when everything's going well? But on the opposite of that spectrum, sometimes I I fall away from the Lord. I I fall asleep spiritually when things are going really, really poorly in my life. And instead of turning to God, I I try to trust in myself or try to work through that that problem or that, that trial that I'm going through. And Paul says, those are the times in your life that you need to be extra vigilant. Those are the times that you need to depend on God more. So how do we do that? How do we live out these responsibilities as Christians in light of the day of the Lord? How do we stay awake spiritually? Well, for sure, doing it in community is easier than doing it by ourselves. You know, this is a letter that was written to a group of Christians, not one singular Christian. These letters would have been read and uh, studied and, 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 and then applied and lived out in the context of community. And so what that means for us is that we need to place a priority on gathering together for worship, just like we're doing now. We don't do this to to check off that little box at the end of the week. Now, there's something uh, spiritual, there's something supernatural that happens when we gather together. We, We gather like this, and we encourage each other, and we challenge each other, and we hold each other accountable. Friends, it will be very difficult for you to fall asleep spiritually when you have some kind of regular interaction and fellowship with Christians with whom you're sharing life with. We've been given some responsibilities in Jesus. How we live them out is what Paul goes on to talk about next. Okay, The, the how could be described as our resources in Jesus. And we see that in verse 8. He says, but since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. And put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. Paul wrote another letter later in his life to the church in the city of Ephesus. And he uh, spends a fair amount of time in that letter talking about what he calls our spiritual armor. I think that that section in Ephesians is is really just an expansion of what he says here. Paul talks about some of the, the spiritual resources that we have in Jesus. And he talks about them in terms of armor that a soldier would wear. So he says, faith and love. What is that? Well, that's something that's going to cover and guard our heart. What's faith? Faith is the knowledge of God and his promise. That's what faith does. It it clings to God and his promises, that God loves you, that God is for you, even when everything around you seems to indicate the opposite. When life gets painful and and difficult and God seems to be absent, faith says, no, God is here. God loves me. He's with me. He's going to get me through this. And with faith, you have what you need to obey God joyfully in the middle of a world that puts absolutely no importance on obedience to God at all. So when you are tempted to, to join in with the evil around you, faith says, no, God has something better for me than this. And I'm going to exercise my faith that obeying God right now is going to bring more joy or satisfaction than the temporary pleasure that this sin is going to bring. Friends, I guarantee you that every single one of us are going to have the opportunity to exercise that kind of faith this coming week. So, do you have faith in God like that? If you have staked your eternity with God, what about staking your eternity? your faith in God in those everyday areas. Right along with that, we have love. And and this is the ability from God to love him and to love others. And you know how that helps us wait for the day of the Lord? It keeps us from becoming pessimistic. 
man, there's so much wrong with this world. And it would be so easy to look at the world around you and look at people around you and just say, you know what, (laughs) forget it all. I'm just going to do me. I'm going to hang with my little uh, group of of Christians. We're going to have this little holy huddle, and we're just going to kind of forget everything else that's going on around us. This armor of love gives us a heart that is concerned for this world and its people. And it prompts us to reach out and to, to serve people with compassion. I don't just think about myself. I'm concerned with you. I'm concerned with others. And then Paul talks here about the hope of salvation as a helmet. What does that do? Well, it's something that protects our, our mind. You know, the, the biblical idea of, of hope is not wishing. Shane talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Right? Biblical hope is not, man, I hope that that happens but I'm not really sure it will. No, biblical hope is an assurance that what God said will happen. The day of the Lord will come. We will be with God. We have that hope. That's a resource that he's given us. And so this takes us to the, to the final word, why. Why is it that we can wait patiently for the Lord with hope and perseverance and without fear and, and hand-wringing in the middle of a crazy world that we live in? Why, why is it that we can do that? Here's why. It's because of our future with Jesus. We do not need to fear this day. And the reason, Paul says, is because of the gospel. Look at verse 9. This is the gospel right here. What's the, what's the gospel? The gospel's good news, right? It's the good news of everything that Jesus has done for us. And so here's the good news in verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the best news that you can hear any day of the week. Jesus is going to bring divine, holy, deserved wrath when he returns, but he's not going to bring it for the Christian. And please understand this. This is super important. It's not because the Christian has lived such a good, moral, holy life. It's not because God has separated all the good people on one side and said, I'm going to bless them, but these bad people over here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge them, I'm going to curse them. No, that, that's not it at all. We will not be appointed wrath. Why? Because Jesus took God's wrath for us. This is what the cross is all about, that, that even though every single one of us in this room this morning, we deserve to be punished by God, Jesus took that punishment himself on the cross. Jesus got what we deserve, and now we're getting what he deserved. The Bible talks about God's wrath in terms of of a cup, in terms of a drink. And the truth is, the good news of the gospel for us this morning is that Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath, and that means there is not a drop left for you to drink if you are in Christ. The most terrifying day for so many on this earth is going to be the greatest day for a Christian. Because of our future, we're going to be with God forever. I love what he goes on to say in verse 10. He says that that Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. That is our future. Whether you pass away before this day or whether you are alive when this day happens, you're going to be with God forever. So what does all this theology mean for us practically? This is interesting stuff, but what does it mean for you tomorrow morning when you're at work or you're on uh, you know, Zoom school? How does this truth make a difference in your life? A couple of things that I want to point out here. A couple of uh, application points for us. First of all, do what needs to be done now to get ready for the day. Do what needs to be done right now in order to get ready for the day. Listen, people don't know when this day is going to happen, but we know it's going to happen. So be ready and stay ready. Are you the type of person that when you go on a trip or a vacation, you pack many days ahead of time? Or are you the person, the kind of person that wakes up the day of and you throw a few things into your bag and, and you go? Um, I'm the first type of person. I like to be prepared. Um, Steph and I are actually getting away for a couple of days. We're, we're leaving after church today and, and going to get away. And, and my dear wife tends to be the second type of that person. You know, wakes up the morning of and just kind of throws some stuff in. You know what? That is perfectly and totally fine when you're going on vacation. But that is not a great long-term plan spiritually. 
Don't be that person that waits. So are you ready right now? What does it mean for you? What would it look like for you to to do what needs to be done now to get ready for that day? Maybe for you it means that you have some business that you need to do with the Lord right now. What is it that is keeping you from fully trusting in Jesus and fully surrendering your life to him right now? And if you've convinced yourself that you're going to do the God thing later, or that you have time to get serious about God down the road, are you sure about that? Is what's keeping you from God right now, is it worth it in the long run? Do what needs to be done now to get ready for the day. Second of all, filter your current trial through the lens of the day. Whatever it is you're going through right now, whatever particular trial or point of suffering, filter that through the lens of the day. You ever watched or wanted to watch a a big game, football, baseball, whatever, but you're not able to watch it live? And so you record it to watch it later, and you try your hardest not to hear any updates about the game. You turn your phone notifications off, stay off social media. Anybody you see during the day, you're like, hey, if you, if you know anything about the game, don't tell me. I haven't seen it. I'm going to watch it later. And so that night, you, you, you sit down, you get ready to watch the game. You turn on the TV, and the first thing you see is the crawler at the bottom of the screen with the final score. Your team won. Your night's ruined, right? Well, not necessarily. The good news is your your team won. The bad news is the thrill of watching the game and not knowing what's going on, that's gone. But that also means that as you watch the game, man, the pressure's off. So when your team goes into halftime and they're losing, they're down, you're not stressing. In fact, it may even be a little bit more enjoyable to watch this game because you know the final outcome. When the future is not in doubt, it makes the present more enjoyable. And so friends, whatever it is that you're going through right now, filter that trial and that setback and that pain and that hassle through the lens of the day. You know the outcome. Jesus wins. And because of that, you can go through what you're going through with a different perspective because you know that your suffering has an end date. And then finally, since God provides the security Be willing to take risks in light of the day. What is it again that Paul says about our future in Christ? What's he say? Verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that your future is secure. It means that you are completely and totally safe in the long run. It means that you can do the scary thing right now of taking faithful risks for God. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, whatever that thing is that you're hesitating doing right now because you're not sure what other people would think, you can take that risk in light of the fact that your future is secure. That's what faith is. It's willingness to look foolish to people who don't get it. And think about the history of the people of God that took those faithful risks. I'm sure that Noah looked like a a complete fool building an ark. I'm sure the Israelites looked absolutely insane as they marched around the walls of Jericho blowing trumpets. I'm sure David looked completely foolish squaring up against Goliath. But that's what we do. Because we know that our future with God is secure, we can take those risks for God right now, knowing that God's got us. You know, at the end of last week's passage and then the end of today's passage, about the specifics of these end times events, I love that the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says, I want you to take all of this knowledge that I've given you, all these nuts and bolts details, and I want you to encourage each other with them. You see that in verse 11? He says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. You should be encouraged as we read and study things like this, if you're ready for the day. And Jesus has freed you to live your life in such a way that your life is an encouragement to those around you that they would prepare for this day. So God, we pray that you would help us with this. God, this this topic that brings so much fear and panic and dread to people, Lord, this is meant to encourage Christians, this is meant to encourage the people of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to live our lives in light of this day. We know that this is coming. 
we, we understand, God, that, that Jesus Christ will return. And it could be any moment. It could be any time. And so, God, I pray uh, for all of us today that we would take a look at our lives and we would evaluate and see if there's things that we need to change in our lives, Lord. Maybe a, a sin issue that we need to get serious about. Or, or maybe we need to, to, to trust in you more and we need to practically place our faith and our trust in you about that thing in our life right now that is so painful and so difficult. Lord, I pray that, that you would encourage us with this aspect of the gospel. You, you died for us and you rose again for us and one day, Lord, you're going to come again for us. And I pray that we would be people that live our lives in light of that truth. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us, please? Um, if you spend any time reading in the Gospels, the phrase, the kingdom of God, is you know, all over it. And um, Jesus describes the kingdom of God in a lot of different ways. I remember at one point asking myself, okay, you know, the kingdom of God is this and it is this, but what is the kingdom of God? And I came across this really simple explanation. The kingdom of God is any, anywhere that Jesus reigns as king. Um, I think probably our culture tends to think about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven as the moment when he returns. But it's not limited to that. The kingdom of God exists now if he reigns in our hearts. And so, um, yeah, we, we, have a, we have a choice to be a part of that kingdom or not. Um, so we have a song that's sort of about that. So if you would sing with us. You are good, you are good, you're the only good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world.
according to your arms The riches of your love will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reign I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever reign. well thank you all for being here um, have a great sunday afternoon